Uh, Amenahi relatives, good morning, and Kawika for joining us live for this candid conversation with respect to Save California Salmon's new TEK curriculum, Indigenous Science and Land Stewardship, and how we can all work to restore our relationships to land and water. I'll be facilitating today's conversation. My name is Tralesa Barada. I'm an enrolled member of the Middletown Rancheria Band of Pomo Indians, and I'm the Education Resource Specialist for Redbud Resource Group, a Native women-led nonprofit organization. Our work here at Redbud is focused on increasing visibility of Native peoples through education, research, and community partnerships. We offer a wide variety of programs to support educators, tribal communities, environmental nonprofits, and many others. If you'd like to learn more about Redbud, you can check out our website at www.redbudresourcegroup.org. And now I have the honor of introducing this amazing organization. Save California Salmon's mission is to advocate in the interests of Northern California's salmon and fish dependent people. Their work supports local fisheries and communities who need policies that protect water and to uplift tribes and the general public by engaging in difficult conversations about water pollution and beneficial use issues. Before I let these other beautiful people introduce themselves, I'd just like to take a moment to acknowledge the land that I join you from, land that I'm a gracious guest on. I currently live and work on the traditional homelands of the Coast Miwok people, in the town of Katadi, whose name is derived from the name of a Coast Miwok village that once flourished here. Because of the state sanctioned genocide that took place in Northern California as a result of the gold rush, there is much we don't know about the history of this place. We do know that the native peoples of this region and throughout all of California are descendants of survivors of the genocide. And we continue to rehabilitate, rematriate and reconcile despite ongoing erasure and environmental destruction. I'd like to express my sincere gratitude to the Federated Indians of Great and Rancheria for being attentive hosts and for all the amazing work they've done locally and for native California. Okay, I'm gonna let Taylor say hello and introduce herself. And then our three roundtable speakers can say a little something about themselves and then we'll get on with the conversation. Hi everybody, my name is Taylor Pennywell and I'm the executive director of Redbud Resource Group. I'm also a tribal member of Berry Creek Rancheria of Time Maidu Indians up in Butte County. And I'm also here in uh, Sonoma County on Coast Miwok, Pomo and Wapo land with Trilesa. Thanks for joining us. Ladies, go ahead and introduce yourself in any order you'd like. Um, I can go first. Uh, Hello, my name is Danielle Frank. I am the Youth Coordinator for Save California Salmon. Um, and I have been working on some of the education curriculum for a few years now. Um, it's a really amazing project and I'm super excited to talk about it. Uh, thank you, Redbud, for having us and I'm excited. Yeah, I can go next. Um, I'm Araceli Moreno. I'm the um, Youth Education Advocate at um, Safe Cover and Salmon. Um, I do a little bit of um, a curriculum design. Um, so I helped uh, with the TK curriculum. Um, and then I also do a lot of youth engagement and community engagement. Um, so here in this area, usually Central Valley. So uh, I'm currently on Patwin land, um, which also is also known as Yolo County. Um, but we also do work um, in the Sacramento Valley and uh, surrounding areas as well. Um, and I'm looking forward to this conversation. Uh, hey, young Michaela Holia. Hello, my name is Michaela. Um, I am the Coastal Youth Education Educational Advocate, and um, I reside on the uh, Hoopa Valley Reservation. And I'm excited for this conversation. Danielle Araceli, Michaela, thank you so much for joining me today. Um, would you guys mind starting the conversation off with a quick summary of the new curriculum? Sure. 
Sure, Danielle, do you wanna you wanna do that? Thanks. Yeah, um, so the curriculum itself, if you wanna just maybe just pop your screen up, Araceli. Uh, the curriculum itself is a project that really is just really unique and one of a kind in so many ways. Uh, Save California Salmon, our kind of education reform project started with the water advocacy and Native California communities curriculum, and that was um, inspired by the Hoopa Valley High School Water Protectors Club. It was a place where high school students could learn about water policy and water law and the California State Water Board, what they did, how we could have a voice in these spaces. Um, and so we finished our first curriculum and we just realized that there was something missing, all of these things that we were trying to explain, this perspective that we were trying to bring in using our first curriculum. It was so hard. You can't understand how these laws affect people unless you understand what's at stake with these laws, what these laws are affecting. And so that was kind of some of the some of the ways that we were able to translate this into a curriculum. Um, we had so many amazing community members, cultural bearers, teachers, educators, people on the SES team who, you know, grew up with this, this separate, this knowledge that not many people can, not many people can access and not many people, um, you know, really understand. And this knowledge is very important in the way that TEK really, it shows that the, there's no disconnect between people and nature and people and the land that people and the land are one and the same, that people themselves are a part of the ecosystem that we live within. You know, it, that's one of the big things today in Western science. It can feel very separate. It can feel like we're in charge and that this land is, you know, we're managing it and we're in charge and all of these things. It feels so separated. TEK is the exact opposite. It highlights that connection between people and the land, knowing that this land has always been caretaken, that all of the lands in the states have originally, they were not left by themselves. They weren't marked as conservation lands and left alone and flourished because that's not, that's not the ecosystem we live within. The ecosystem we live within has to have a balance. It needs all of these things to care for itself and care for each other. And native people are one of those native species that have to be present in these spaces. Um, and so this TEK curriculum goes over, as you can see, we have six different modules. Um, the first one is pretty much, you know, one of the biggest questions that is asked in all of these spaces, what is TEK? What does that really mean? And so we were able to kind of go through and you know, I think that there can be a little variation of definition of TEK, but we got the, we talked to as many, you know, amazing Indigenous educators, community members, uh, uh, cultural bearers as we could, and really found that, that answer to that question, what is TEK in the sense of what is appropriate to teach in this school, what is going to help my students make space for Native kids and their knowledge, and what is going to, you know, make Native kids feel validated with their knowledge. And so module two goes into fires and forests, three is rivers and fish, and then down to module six, um, which is the California's 3038 and land back. So this is some 30 by 30. This is something that's huge going on in our nation right now. It's something that is having big conversations and is overall going to have a big impact, but it's also not something that we usually learn about in a sixth to eighth grade setting, which is what this curriculum is standardized for, sixth through eighth grade. And so it really starts those conversations of, you know, what is the knowledge we're going to need going into these spaces in real life? If we want to go into these spaces and, you know, be influential in California policy and understand it and know the way that policy affects our homelands, you know, we start learning. If we start learning about it in sixth, seventh and eighth grade, we're going to have a huge head start. Whereas if we start understanding California policy as a freshman in college, which is most the case. And so um, I think that's one thing that's well, I know that's one thing that's like extremely unique about this curriculum is the way that it really involves real life scenarios and real life things that are happening right now straight into a curriculum. And as you can see, um, the illustrations are beautiful and they're, they're very meaningful, which is the important thing. This is something that 
you know, as a Native student, if I walked into my science class and I've seen this on the screen, you best believe I'm going to sit down, take notes, listen, hang on to every word. And that's not always the case. Um, you know, in some spaces where science has been you know, so colonized and we live with this idea of disconnect, it can be hard to hold those spaces as Native kids. It can be hard having to argue your way through how the gold rush was actually a bad thing. You don't really care about the economics, you care about the people and how you have to argue your way through anthropology lectures every now and then, you know, explaining why these things should not be removed in this way and kept in a glass cat glass case in front of the classroom um and so just holding that space for for that knowledge and um understanding that it's so vital in these spaces that we're in and it's especially now with what's happening in our climate you know this is going to be something that our students our youth have to get involved in our climate situation is you know drastically going downhill and so making sure that we're providing them with the tools in order to get the best head start that they possibly can in both worlds is really um, important. And then also with the illustrations, you know, we understand at SES that there are so many different learning techniques. It's, you know, and some, some kids don't learn by sitting there and writing a 500 word essay, but they do learn if they sit there and put their thoughts onto paper with colored pencils and talk to their friends about it and answer questions about it and see a picture about it, that's something that sticks with them. So maybe they won't get the vocabulary words from the lesson, but they'll get the image and that says enough. You know, a picture is worth a thousand words. And so I think these ones are worth a few more. And so, um, yeah, that's something that was really important too, is just the different learning techniques. As we go more into this conversation, we'll be able to break the curriculum down a little more but a few things that also it has, um, just the variety of activities that come with each lesson. Some are hands-on, some are, you know, really pen to paper, and some are, you know, more artistic. We ask for, there's options for videos and slideshows and TikToks and things that students are going to be really interested in making. And um, that was something that was really important, just making sure we have options and yeah, that's kind of my basic overview. And then we'll be able to go a little bit more into depth as we get farther into the conversation. Beautiful. Thank you, Danielle. That's a great intro. And I just want to give a quick shout out to Jackie Moon for the artwork because it is amazing. I love it so much. Um, and also want to shout out to the Indigenous knowledge holders and Indigenous scientists who who contributed to this beautiful curriculum. Um, you're right, it's absolutely unique. Um, is there another slide? Did you wanna go on to the next slide? Yeah, uh, let's see. Uh, so the next slide is just kind of um, really jumping into um, more of the lessons and modules. So the first slide was uh, overview of the whole curriculum as a module. Um, this next lesson is um, this is kind of how the lessons are laid out. Um, each module has three to four lessons um, about the module topic. Um, here we see lesson one um, and module, um, I believe is module one, lesson one, which is uh, what is TAK. So as uh, my colleague had said, uh, Danielle, there's videos, presentations that um, educators can use, guiding questions, and those can always change um, depending on what the educator wants to use, uh, goals, um, activities, and we made sure to provide uh, several options for activities as um, you know, every um, uh, youth learns differently, as Danielle said. Um, so we have options. Uh, these are just a few options for this lesson, but there's options um, for uh, creating con uh, social media content or writing, um, arts. It really depends on what the student is interested in. So we try to provide those different options for them. Um, and then if my Danielle or um, Michaela, if you want to add anything to lesson, this lesson overview. If not, I can move on. I love the structure of it. As an educator, I feel like it would be really easy to read. And when you look at all the lessons in a row, like I did, it's like very clear. It's a very clear narrative. I love the design. Well done on that. Yeah. One thing that was really important in this curriculum, too, was noting that we are hoping for it to be, you know, implemented in the state as widely as possible. 
And so noting that it wasn't always going to be indigenous, um, you know, educators pushing this curriculum. And so there's actually a teacher's narrative involved, which is really um, unique and special. So at the beginning of every module as an educator, there's like a note to you about, you know, you know, welcome to this curriculum. This is the teacher's narrative. As a teacher, here's the narrative you can use to start having these hard conversations. And I think that was something that was really um, helpful for a lot of people who weren't as familiar. You know, this is something that, you know, I could teach off the back of my hand because I've lived this entire life, but that's rarely the case um, in public education. So we were really hoping that we could push our narrative through this curriculum. And we did that by being able to have that teacher's narrative available. And it really, you know, these conversations aren't always easy to have, especially for a lot of teachers. They are a product of the public education system, meaning they themselves did not get the best education and are having to relearn a lot of this. And so um, I think that teacher's narrative is really important in starting those conversations and really supports the educators and like, you know, I, no one ever had this conversation with me. How do I have it with these students? We will help with that. And the teacher's narrative helps with that a lot. Oops, I think I skipped a slide. Sorry. Um, so yeah, that was a lesson overview. Um, I skipped the module overview. Um, but I mean, it's basically um, what I mentioned, uh, the module, every module has uh, three to four lessons. Um, and then uh, each lesson has all this other information that uh, the educator can use. Um, and each module has, you know, all of this stuff like uh, teacher narrative, like uh, Danielle was saying, uh, lesson goals, keywords and concepts, videos, um, lab projects, if that's um, something the educator wants to do. Um, and activities can range from being outdoors or being indoors, uh, depending on um, again, what the educator uh, has capacity for. Lessons meet state standards, which is important um, for teachers to know um, and be able to implement in their classrooms. And we also provide additional resources. Um, but um, yeah, apologies about the skip, um, but um, if my colleagues want to say anything else. Okay. Awesome. Well, I, like I said, I think this is such a cool curriculum. I really enjoyed um, watching the videos that are linked in the PDFs. And uh, I learned so much just from reading all the background info, like the teacher narrative. I also was raised in the public education system. Uh oh. You're good. Oh, I am. Okay, sorry. <laughs> um, anyways, I also was raised in the public education system, so I didn't learn any of this. I can only imagine how amazed I would have felt to see that artwork that Jackie Moon made and and to learn these things from, from other Native people. Um, so let's move on to the questions that I have for you. And each of you are welcome to answer these questions in any order you want. Um, my first question is, why is TEK curriculum important in classrooms? I feel like we kind of touched on this, but if you have anything else to add, why do you think TEK curriculum is important in classrooms today? Danielle, you want to start us off and we'll just go, I guess we can just go in the, the same order we've been going. <laughs> yeah, I think Michaela, did you want to start us off? Uh, yes. Um... <laughs> I believe that teaching this curriculum can be really beneficial in understanding like different perspectives that aren't all just from one narrative. I feel like we've been like fed one narrative for so long and now we're like kind of opening our mind and taking on like new knowledges such as TK. Yeah, thanks. You know, I totally agree with that. And I think one thing about this TEK that's really important is it like really provides space for Native students in an institution that has been historically really dangerous for Native people. And so this, you know, provides, it validates, it also really validates their knowledge and who they are 
at a time when they really need it, you know, in junior high, sixth through eighth grade, that's a time where you start to question a lot of things and, you know, think a lot of things are changing. And so I think, you know, you need validation in a lot of ways. And I think that this curriculum can be really validating and, you know, understanding that what they know is really important and the knowledge that they hold is really unique and special and it's really vital and that it's um, something that, you know, they have that can really help them. Um, and also like TEK is the most ancient form of science that we have. You know, we always want to be exercising, like in, in order to get the most correct answer, we wanna be exercising and getting, or we wanna be working towards that answer in every way possible. And so we wanna be using all of the different resources we have available, all the different knowledge that we have so that we can get the most correct and best possible answer when we're talking about what is healthy for climate, what is healthy for native students, what is healthy for you know biodiversity. Um, and I think that you know TEK is one of those most ancient forms of knowledge that is available. We need to be exercising our right to use that. Um, and this really introduces that at a young age, which is you know really amazing. Um, and that's my perspective. Yeah, um, I think students face a lot of hurdles in their classrooms uh, because of their race or gender, socioeconomic status, culture, et cetera. Um, and bringing in curriculum like TK into the classroom is one way to break classroom barriers like that and be more inclusive and equitable in the classroom. Um, and um, this can be done by building culturally, culturally responsive lessons like these, right? Um, because starting strong, uh, strong foundation of diversity and inclusion in the classroom um, or in education, it really creates um, uh, opportunities for, or bigger opportunities, right? For students or youth. Um, and um, it can expand or build um, more equ equitable systems, um, not only in education, but in other uh, systems that uh, oppress youth and uh, BIPOC communities. I love those answers and I love how you included equity in that and how this kind of curriculum doesn't just benefit native students, but it also benefits other ethnicities present in the classroom, right? Um, awesome. Next question is, if you are a student working through this curriculum, what do you think would be your favorite lesson or module and why? Um, for me, it was specifically like module five, lesson three. It's like an activity where you're taking a field trip um, to a local beach and identifying shells. And I feel like learning through experience is like way more beneficial than say if you were in the classroom looking at these same shells. Like I feel like it would just be more in your memory and helpful uh, for learning. Um, I think my favorite module as I went through this um, was the forest and fire module. Uh, cultural fire is something that has been really present in my community, well, becoming more present in my community and really, um, you know, it's really powerful and it comes with such great and ancient knowledge. And it's something that my first mentor um, was really, really into and excited about. And it just really like was not something that was ever talked about. You know, fire in the westernized idea of science, fire is looked at as bad. It's looked at as dangerous and, and damaging. But in our perspective, we understand that fire itself is a gift and it's used to rejuvenate things and keep things to a good level. And, you know, it's medicine. And so seeing that in a classroom, seeing that fire is not bad and, you know, that you can go into another career as a person in cultural fire, that's an option. And we're setting you up to do that with this curriculum by learning more about cultural fire. Like all of it just really excited me. And um, it just, I, I love cultural fire. So that would have been my favorite module for sure. Just one, they're all amazing. Um, but yeah, if I was a, a student, um, I think for me, it would be the, the first module, which is what is TK. 
Um, and that's because um, I think it'd be interesting to see, um, learn about it, right? Um, about uh, Native Californian, um, Native California, and seeing the differences in, or similarities between TK and Native California and the traditional knowledge from my family's ancestral homelands, which is Mexico. Um, so just be interesting to see that and um, really um, learn about uh, a different culture and peoples. Totally. And I feel like working in Native education as a Native person, I didn't, I wasn't exposed to any traditional knowledge, any Indigenous knowledge, really, for that matter. Um, and literally every day my mind is blown that this knowledge has existed for like centuries and um I can just imagine you know like Michaela was saying walking on the beach and identifying different shells and just like learning about how fire isn't necessarily bad and just like growing this like newfound respect for the land that we live on right um I'm so excited for students to to go through this and I, I hope you guys share like feedback you get from teachers <laughs> Um, okay, let's see. Our next question. Let me double check the time. Okay, we're good. Um, do you have any advice for non-native educators who will be implementing this curriculum? Um, I can start. I definitely think, you know, um, definitely not perfect um advice, but something that you know is that I would recommend using as a resource is like in class presentations and the videos you know this no, this really isn't knowledge that a non-indigenous educator is going to have and they might not have really any link to this knowledge this might be completely new to them too and so just utilizing like those videos are really you know educated and and or indigenous educators sharing like their entire lesson like you could those videos are lessons and you know just really implementing them and learning from them as you know and letting the students know that too that's okay like if there's a question that you don't really know how to answer give them resources you know give them SES give them you know me give them us and we can help answer those questions but also it's okay to let them know like hey this is new like this isn't something that has always been welcome in the public education system it's not something I'm super familiar with but it's the best type of knowledge that I can give you it's the best education that I can offer you and so I'm going to sit here and I'm going to learn with you and we're going to utilize all these videos and all these activities and all of these amazing people who are teaching us right now you know if you have extra questions let me know and I'll give you I'll send an email or find a resource to try and help you answer that question or reach out to SES and see if I'm close enough to have a class presenter because we do class presentations quite often. Just really utilizing that those resources available and also like not being afraid to say that you don't know because this is something new for a lot of people. And so, and I feel like that that is, you know, being truthful with students, especially these students are getting older, you know, helping them understand that the world is changing for the better and that this is part of it and we're going to learn together. It can be really um, more like teamwork in a classroom setting. Um, that was really good, Danielle. And I'm going to probably like say some of the things that you've already said. Um, when I was a teacher aide, um, my first experiences with SES was their um, in-classroom presenters. And I noticed that a lot of the first graders were really excited whether or not they were native or not to like learn like these uh, sciences or native STEAM is what they call it, NTEK. Um, like I said in the beginning, I believe that teaching this curriculum can be really beneficial in understanding different perspectives um, that aren't all just from one narrative. And it's it's okay to not know about all the ins and outs of TEK and to make this a new learning experience. Some of the um, time, like Native students already are very, are already very knowledgeable in TEK because they grew up around practicing um, these sciences at home with family. And I think that admitting that you don't know much about TEK is a good first step in starting to learn about it. So, yeah, I um, um, kind of what Danielle and Michaela have been saying. Um, I think um, 
advice wise, I think teachers, um, like this TK uh, curriculum really provides teachers with teacher education um, uh, on redefining and reframing their def maybe deficit perceptions of uh, Native students, right? Um, because as Michaela said, students are equipped with their own knowledge, right? And understanding of the world of the world around them. So um, that's important to take into consideration. Um, by bringing in this nat narrative or Native curriculum um, into their classrooms, um, uh, you know, regardless of the teacher's race or the student's race, um, uh, their student population, right? Um, it really provides um, worthiness and proper consideration of the Native voice. Um, and what do I mean by that? Um, if the curriculum or the teacher, the teacher's curriculum is always, uh, you know, they're always using the narrative of white culture or white perspectives, then they're putting white worth on top of every other BIPOC narrative that exists, right? So um, learning to participate in a more culturally responsive um, uh, teaching method um, in their classroom is important. And uh, this TK, TK curriculum can really help them do that. If it could be a good start for teachers. Araceli, I love how you break down society. I feel like you would make a good sociologist. <laughs> um, and I love how the curriculum is designed for middle schoolers because like Michaela was saying, there's like this hands-on aspect of it, but then there's also like Danielle was saying, this digital aspect of it. And we do live in a digital, digital age and we're seeing that kids are responding better to um, interacting with the internet more and with with videos. And um, I love the, the TikTok videos that you guys have included. And I hope that the students follow these, um, um, what do you call it? Um, influencers, <laughs> these native influencers. Um, okay, we have one more question. Um, okay, this is, it starts as a statement. Indigenous science versus Western science. Okay, how are they different and where do they converge? Uh, I can start out with this one. I think from, I am, a, I am a science major right now. I'm studying environmental science. And I grew up some, on my, I didn't leave, you know, my reservation until like four days before college. Um, and I am only live an hour away. So my whole life, I've been submerged in indigenous science. That's everything I've ever known. And so going through, and I did go to school on my reservation. My local history teacher was my medicine woman. I had a very different education than the public education system provides. And then, you know, I got into college and I was pretty shocked. I was um, just kind of blown away by like the disconnect. It was something that was so new to me of all of these teachers like trying, pushing this narrative of like, we're above these things, we're studying these things, like we're gonna fix these things to benefit us. Like, you know, we wanna make sure that we conserve lands to benefit us. We wanna do this to benefit us. And it was always like some exploitation of the land. Like it was never actually like, we wanna take care of it. Like it was, we wanna take care of it because we want something, we wanna exploit it. And so that was something that I was like, how am I like studying to, to save this, like to save biodiversity, to protect these things. And all I'm learning about is like how to exploit them. I'm learning how to, you know, use what I can from them. And so um, that was, that's the biggest thing for me as a difference is the disconnect in westernized science, that idea of we're disconnected from the land, we're in charge of the land, you know, this all needs to work for us when in indigenous science and the actual reality is an ecosystem, you know, we all know that an ecosystem needs its native plants, its native species. It needs things to balance each other out. It needs that. That's how an ecosystem works and takes care of itself. And so, and native people are one of the native species that have to be there in order to make things balanced, in order to make sure that our lands are caretaken in the way that they're meant to, we have to provide that knowledge of how they're meant to be taken care of because we've been doing it for thousands of years. And so, um, yeah, that that disconnect from Westernized science is just so 
it's, you know, I think it's a part of the big problem of the climate crisis right now is people thinking that, you know, this, that everything belongs to us and we have every right to drill into anywhere we want and take anything we want. And we just have to fix it good enough so it keeps providing for us, not flourish. And um, so that's something that I've, I'm still trying to find my, my footing in both spaces of, yeah. When I thought of this question, I was kind of thinking about how um, a lot of people thought to stop like forest fires was to stop fires in general. And um, indigenous people knew that we did like controlled like burns to uh, take out all the underbrush under the forest floor so that it wouldn't build up to create these massive forest fires. And that, um, as Danielle was saying, is like humans aren't taken completely out of the equation. We have to work with nature because that's what like we've been doing bef um, before Western sciences came in. And yeah. Yeah, um, for me, I'm still learning um, or decolonizing my mind, if you want to say. Um, so this question is kind of difficult for me to answer, but just on a personal note, um, yeah, um, it, it's really important, uh, indigenous science um, and ways of, you know, um, of life, <laughs> because um, as a person, like I said, um, my abuelita or my grandma, she would always recommend to the family, you know, um, indigenous practices of healing um, certain ailments. But because we were so colonized of Western culture and medicines and stuff like that, we would disregard it, right? Like, oh, your teas, what? That's just, what is that, that right? Um, so really learning more about um, our background, our culture, where we come from and where these um, um, indigenous ways comes from is, is really important in, in putting, um, like I said, putting worth on it, right? How they, they are worthy of, um, of our considerations. Um, so yeah, um, it's important to learn. Um, it's important to learn uh, about our cultures and stuff like that and um, making sure the public school systems, um, uh, you know, talk about it and uh, provide worth um, in these, um, um, and learning about these things. You know, Araceli, most of us are still decolonizing our minds because most of us grew up in the public ed school, public education system. Uh, Danielle is one of the lucky ones. Um, I'm constantly trying to decolonize my mind. And what made me think of this question is something that I read in um, my master's degree program by Vine Deloria Jr. and um, Daniel Wildcat, Power in Place. Um, they talk about how we need to include both indigenous science and Western science in order to create a holistic picture, a holistic understanding of things, right? And so I thought, well, where, what does it look like when these two sciences converge? Do any of you have any thoughts on that? Um, yeah, I definitely have thought a lot about this because that's kind of how I'm trying to, you know, live my life in the future is I want to, you know, be uh, someone working on water using Western science, using these new forms of science that we have available. You know, they are so, they're, they're also very vital, but also using my perspective and the knowledge that I have that I know is thousands of years old to really bring that together. Like, how am I going to spend the rest of my life using all of the resources that I have available, Westernized science and indigenous science to create a better place for, you know, a better situation for my homelands, a better place for native people and native culture. And um, so I've thought a lot about it and I think, you know, there's, it definitely is possible. And I think it's that getting that understanding of both of, you know, using we're using the resources that we have most available but we're not using you know we're not trying to fix something enough to for it to give back 
Like we need to be looking at things as a full circle as they are. Like that's the one thing that from indigenous science has to be translated over to westernized science. If we're ever going to like bridge the two connections, bring them together and use them in a way that's, you know, 100% cohesive and like that's going to make the most change is if we get that understanding of every the, the entire ecosystem, the full circle and, you know, understanding that Indigenous knowledge is so, so important because of its ancient form, because of the knowledge that comes with it. But also westernized science is something that Indigenous people are also a part of. Like we're taking huge leads, you know, and so just using, finding the right balance of using them co cohesively in a way that's um, going to be for the benefit of the land and not for the benefit and understanding that for the benefit of the land is the benefit of humanity and vice versa. It's not, you know, benefiting the land so that it can benefit humanity, but it's, you know, so that we can all be a circle and all benefit from everything. Um, so not quite sure there yet, but anyway, if you know how exactly to get there, let me know, but it's, um, it's a work in progress. Balancing is a tough task, isn't it? Finding balance. And when you said uh, we need to keep in mind all of humanity, I never considered this. You all seem pretty young, so I assume you don't have children. But I didn't really think about the future generations until I had my son and how we need to keep in mind not only those who are living today and our land and water relatives as well, but the generations that aren't born yet, the generations generations that are still to come. We have to leave enough for them too, right? So thank you so much, guys, for all of your amazing input. <clears throat> um, I just wanted to ask if there were any other resources available on your website that you'd like to point out. Uh, yeah, we have our last curriculum also. Um, that is really a good tool to have alongside this and goes a lot more into water law and policy, which um, can, be, and that's high school aimed. So like this would be amazing to see a student go through this in junior high and get an understanding of TEK and then go into high school and be able to understand how to implement that into water policy and federal decisions. Um, but if you have anything else to Araceli, please. Oh, yeah. No, it was just, yeah, similarly, and just that there's... Um... Um, if there's educators that have questions or um, concerns or want to, you know, review the curriculum or have ideas, uh, they can feel free to reach out to us and we can help them um, um, help them with lesson planning or a speaker. Um, they want to invite a speaker to the classroom and stuff like that. So um, our information, I believe, is on the website um, or the general email is on the website. Um, so, yeah, um, Michaela, I don't know if you want to add anything else. So just want to point out that that website is californiasalmon.org. I see a phone number and I see an email address, info at californiasalmon.org. Does that sound right? Um, and then how can people support your work? Do you guys accept donations or what's, what's the deal with that? Yeah, we do accept donations um, and the link for that will also be on our website, but we, we do, um, you know, volunteer, we do cleanup days um, in several places and we're just, there's chances to volunteer um, and then, but yeah, definitely donations. And then we do a lot of call to actions around policies and things. So our social media most active is um, our Instagram, California Rivers. And we share calls to action, we share events we're having and spaces where we really need people to send a quick email or a quick call to help influence this decision. Um, and so that's something that I would definitely recommend checking out if you want to help us out. Perfect. Great. Um, and, and then last question to you guys, are you offering any trainings around this curriculum? Yeah, we have a teacher's training that I think is done quarterly. I can't remember. Um, uh, it's either done twice or three times a year, um, and uh, it's a really good space for educators to learn more or go um, deep dive into the curriculums and um, be in a space with other educators who also want to learn about their curriculum. Um, and I think um, if they want more information, again, they can email us about um, if they're interested in participating yeah, we, in one of these trainings. We do have one coming up pretty soon. Um, 
And if so, if you like have to be in it, we'll really need to email us as soon as possible and we'll see if we can help you out. And then we should be having one, you know, hopefully later in the summer also. Amazing. That's great. That's such an important resource for educators. Um, well, thank you so much for all the amazing work you guys have done and for being open to having this conversation live on social media and for all your thoughtful answers to my questions. Uh, here's some more future conversations like this. I hope you guys have a beautiful rest of the day. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you guys so much space. for having us. Bye.